Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It's Friday, November 19th. It's my sister and brother-in-law's anniversary. And this is very important. Happy anniversary, Kim and Evan, because I don't know if you know this, Mark. Do you know that I fix them up on a blind date? I only get a little giggle from the whole thing. I really do. It's kind of a cool thing. It's kind of a great thing to actually be friends with a person that you're your beloved sister marries. So for more than three decades, I've had just the most fun watching these anniversaries tick by. And uh, so happy anniversary, you guys. Love you. Okay. Now, onto the program. This is the program that does take the mystery out of your financial life. I hope it does. And the way we do that is we encourage you to send us your financial questions. And you do so by going to our website, jillonmoney.com and clicking the contact button. Now, we're going to do a very long email question. So I'm going to try to do this methodically because it is long. This is the kind of thing where I wish you'd come on the air with us because it's probably a better story with your voice to it. But let me just get into it, okay? Because this is Joanna's question and the subject is helping aging aunt and uncle. Hi, Jill and Mark. My very dear to me aunt and uncle are struggling with a decision of whether to move out of their home where they have lived for nearly 50 years. Hmm. My aunt is in her early 70s. Uncle is in his late 70s. My aunt wants to move because my uncle is in poor health and she's overwhelmed by taking care of him and the home. I get that. He does not want to move. Ugh. And there isn't anywhere they could move that would be less expensive than their current home, which is currently worth about $500,000 that would fulfill their needs. They also don't like the idea of living in an apartment complex in the age of COVID, as both are immunocompromised. I think the move itself would be even more overwhelming than staying put. Okay, it sounds like staying put might work. Let's think of this through. So Joanna says, I've been thinking through creative solutions to make their current home more manageable and safe for them as they age. One idea I had would be to purchase the home from them at a below market rate and have them use the proceeds to make improvements to the home. Maybe redo the bathroom with a walk-in shower and add ramps and grab bars, et cetera. And I would take on the landlord duties like landscaping and snow removal and repairs, and they could live for the rest of their lives. Then once they pass, I would use the proceeds from the home sale to pay back what I put into the home, plus an additional percentage as a return, and then divide the remaining proceeds according to their estate plan. It's likely they are already planning to leave at least some of the assets to me anyway. So she says she wants to purchase it in the range of $50,000 by taking out a mortgage, which would be enough to make the improvements. Here are our stats. She's 32. The husband's 33. They're attorneys. They, let's see. Oh, they make a lot of money. So she makes two seventy five dollars with a $65,000 bonus. Husband makes eighty. dollars I like my job and plan to stay at the firm for at least three to four more years. And we'll have lockstep pay increases as well as increasing year-end bonuses. My husband's in a different, less lucrative field of law, but will presumably make more each year. He is first year associate and she's a fourth year. She doesn't really see them making less than 350 grand a year combined over the next 15 years. Ay, ay, ay. This is getting complicated, Mark. She's got 80 grand in law school loans. She's paused paying on them. She'll throw a big chunk of her bonus towards the principal. We bought a house last year for $600,000. Estimated value is now 725. They've got $469,000 remaining on the mortgage, a 30-year 2.65% interest loan. They've got an 18-month-year-old. They've got four grand in her 529 plan, um, and they're going to put $1,000 a month into the 529. They've got rainy day savings, $25,000. That's too low already. I can tell you that's too low. They max their 401ks and traditional IRAs. They've got $92,000 in the 401k, hers, seventeen five dollars in the husband's 401k, about forty five dollars in a Roth, and sixty eight dollars in a rollover, seventeen dollars in traditional IRAs. They've got $11,000 in an investment account. They've got life insurance, wills, estate plan in the works. Once my husband starts taking a paycheck next year, we will have approximately $20,000 a month in income and $11,000 a month in expenses. Time horizon, they plan to renovate their kitchen in the next three to four years, and they think that's going to cost about 150 grand. You ready for these questions, Mark? Number one, 
Is my plan with respect to my aunt and uncle's house crazy? Yes. But I'm not going to say crazy bad. It's just, it's, it's not the most efficient way to get the job done. Are we even in a position to offer this, assuming they would go for it? Probably not. Is there a less complicated way to achieve the same goal? Yes. Here's what I think. I think that a reverse mortgage is what you do. She says she doesn't think they would accept help outright. But what I do think is that what you could try to do is offer them help in managing it. And since you're both attorneys, what I would say is you're precisely the kinds of people who could help understand a reverse mortgage and work with someone who could maybe kind of wind through the process of what that reverse mortgage would mean. Um, And so essentially, reverse mortgages are available for people over the age of 60 where they can extract the equity from their home in reverse, right? They take the money out. And if you were able to really go through this kind of a contract and, and work with someone who can help you out, someone who's done this before, then I think that's the easiest game plan. I think you buying it from them for below market is not a great idea. I just don't. First of all, there's this weird tax implication about that. So I'm not even sure that like anyone would give you a mortgage or anything based on that. And I don't know if you can, I don't know, Mark, what's the, isn't there a tax rule about buying something at below market? I don't think this is really the best way to get what you want done. I really, really don't. So that's what I would say. Okay, this is from Lee, who says, love your show. I'd like to ask you about our financial situation. We're married. The husband is 63. The wife is 59. Social Security in 2023 will be about 26,000 annually. The wife's Social Security in 20, three years later will be 28,000, another almost 13,000 in pension. Assets, 2.2 million. Non-retirement, 60%. Retirement, 40%. House not included. Okay, good. Annual expenses, 102000 They retired six months ago. Well, since you're already retired, what are you asking me for, right? <laughs> Decision made. So let's see what we got here, Mark. Let's just do, a, do some maths, as they say in England. So what do we got? We got, they got 26 in Social Security, another 28 in Social Security, and another 13 in pension. So they are about two thirds of the way there in terms of their expenses. So they need to come up with 45 grand a year from a $2.2 million portfolio. What do you think, Mark? Doable, not great. I don't love it. Exactly. Here's the problem. That's exactly the point. So Mark says the social security is not kicking in. So here's what happens. You do have 2.2 million, which is great. However, you have a ways to go. You're going to have to deplete some of the non-retirement assets or some of the retirement if you want. That means that you're not going to, you don't have $2.2 million. You have less than $2.2 million. Is there some part-time income potentially? Are there other assets you're not telling us about? Is there some other idea here? It's tight. It's doable. It's not great. That's what I would say. Follow up with us if you need more help. Okay, guys, I know what you're thinking. Two million dollars, a lot of money. It is. They're young. This is 60 year old. Right. You could live for 35 years. It is a long retirement that we are trying to fund. And you are counting on returns from your investments to be like they were in the last 20 years. And they may not be that good. So you really have to factor that in. All right. Margaret writes, I am 66 years old, divorced. I own my own home and car with no mortgage, no car payments, no credit card debt. Good. I semi-retired last year. I currently work part-time about uh, $8,000 a year is what she earns. She has a pension of $7,900 a year, a year or a month? You think it's a year? Okay. She's got a pension from uh, ex-husband and social security. She's got a money market account with a bunch of money and checking. She's got about $65,000 in emergency reserves and another 60 in a CD. Okay. Uh, oh, the CD she's going to dedicate to split among her six grandchildren. So let's not take, I'm not going to count that. She maxed her 403B contributions for the past eight years. She's got 400 grand in a rollover IRA with Vanguard. And then, and then on top of that, an annuity, 26 grand, a Roth also with Vanguard with 33 grand. Question. When I turn 70 and a half, I need to begin to take RMDs from my Vanguard rollover. Do you? I thought it was 72, Mark. Okay. So I think it's 72. So that's good. 
The big question is, should I start taking some of the money now to reduce the money so I'm not hit with large taxes when I do have to take required minimum distributions? Or can I create a trust with a rollover IRA that might help? No, no, no to trust, not a trust. You can start taking some of the money out of the Vanguard account and pay the taxes. Don't pop yourself into a new tax bracket, but you can do that and do a little bit at a time. So let's see, you've got... Let me just do a quick 20, 30, 40. So you, you've got income. You're just, you know, it's wild. You know, your your income as a single person at the 12% bracket, but you have a standard deduction probably now because you don't have any debt. So what's the standard deduction if for a single? It's like 12 grand or 13 grand. So I would probably say that if you could take the money out that will keep you in the 12% tax bracket little by little, that's what I would do. That's what I would do until you have to start taking money out from those RMDs, which again is 72 for you. Okay. The last question today is one of my favorite topics, sabbatical. Okay. Rebecca's 26 years old and she is planning on taking a four to six month sabbatical. She says she's paid off her student loans. She has no debt. How great is that? She's 26. You need a sabbatical already? Just kind of cracks me up. Okay. I have approximately $60,000 in my 401k, 20 grand in a brokerage account, and a tiny Roth, three grand. All right. My question, I'm thinking about leaving my job in the first quarter of next year. Um, Should I contribute 50% of my paycheck, roughly five grand a month to my 401k in my last months of employment? or contribute my regular 20% for my 401k and save the rest. I already have a six month of emergency fund, sabbatical fund for fun things to do. And I was saving for a house. Mark, you want to pre-fund the retirement or give her extra cash? Okay. Mark is being very Gen X-y on you. And I'll be, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not officially a baby boomer. I'm officially a Gen Xer. So I fit into the same thing. I'm not, we're not sure. So we want to, we wish you could come on the air with us because we desperately want to hear why a 26 year old needs a sabbatical, but okay. Like maybe you just have it and maybe that's fine. I don't know. I don't want to judge it, Rebecca, but I would, I would just have cash. I wouldn't worry about retirement. That would be me. I would have more cash and don't worry about saving for a house right now. Get some cash together and tell us what you're going to do in your sabbatical. (laughs) Mark, sabbatical when you're 26. That's great. I'm just trying to think that myself. I think I was, my sabbatical was, oh, you know what I had to do? I had to get an, I had to figure out how to get a job after being a trader on Wall Street. My sabbatical was I had to learn how to become a salesperson, which I did. Thank you very much to my friends at, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island for teaching me how to sell radio advertising, which is about the hardest sale in the world. Oh, Mark was producing talk radio in Phoenix. So, um, when you're 26 and you need a sabbatical, you must have been working very hard. And I know maybe an investment bank or maybe, I don't know, maybe a lawyer, one of the, you know, there's, there's a lot of those people who do get fried. She has money. Yeah, she's working hard and she's young. So let's find out what she does. Follow up with us. You want to hear what the sabbatical is all about also. Okay. That's it for the program. If you've got a question you want to ask us, you want to tell us when you, what your sabbatical is all about. We'd love to hear from you jillonmoney.com. Click the contact button. That is what we ask of you. And then we'll get your note and we'll try to get you on the air. If you'd like to join us, you can subscribe to our sister broadcast. It's called Eye on Money, wherever you get your favorite podcast or just on our website as well. Check out all the cool stuff that we do on the website. It's really a lot of fun. All of our content is there and you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Okay. It's Friday. I like to do the business on Friday. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We are distributed by Cadence 13. Put your hands metaphorically on someone's back today. It will make that person feel better and it will make you feel better. Grit, growth, grace. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.